great of you all to join us. Uh, I, I, my name is Don Mares, uh, currently president and CEO of Mental Health America of Colorado. And, uh, oh, that's six. Uh, thank you. My, my, the current hat I'm wearing is as uh, a member of the Carter Latino Age Wave Community Advisory Committee, which I'm just thrilled to be a part of, right, Ms. Sanchez? Um, and uh, I wanted to tell you, um, welcome, first of all, to this great uh, day and great luncheon. Uh, we have a lot of wonderful uh, things to celebrate out here. Uh, I wanted to tell you uh, kind of what brings me to this, because, you know, in order to know where you're going, you kind of have to know where you came from and where you are. Um, I'll never forget election night 1995 when my wonderful mother, Priscilla uh, Sanchez Mares, called me to congratulate me on uh, just being elected auditor of Denver. And she said something that put the fear of God in me. She said, you know, you're the first Latino to ever have your signature on every check that the city of Denver issues. And I said, oh, <laughs> I didn't think about that, no. But, but um, and, and now they changed the auditor's job and he doesn't sign the check, so in some way the, the last to, to elected. But, but, the, but it was sort of the, 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 the wonderful weight of responsibility, I guess, that she infused in me, like Mary did, uh, to, all, to, to us, those of us who had wonderful, strong mothers in particular, were, were really uh, blessed with that kind of infusion of community spirit. Uh, whether it was her service on the Latin American Educational Foundation Board uh, as, a, as executive director, my uncle John Sanchez to help start what's now known as Claro, it used to be La Raza. I mean, it's just sort of in our blood. So when the phone rang and it was Cis Ortiz, you know, asking if I would join the advisory committee, you know, I, I couldn't say no. In fact, I, I jumped at the chance because it's a great chance to give back to our wonderful community. So, so that's what brings me to this and, and to be uh, honored to be standing here to welcome all of you. Uh, we have a great program today. Um, we're going to have a presentation from one of our sponsors. We're then going to hear from Sheila Bogdanowitz, a proud GW patriot. I always say that, Sheila, because it is a proud thing, from the Rose Community Foundation. And then, of course, hear from our keynote speaker and, and, and the wonderful award to our incredible awardee. Um, so, uh, but I want to at least uh, before I leave the stage, acknowledge the people who made this happen. So if you all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read through some sponsors and ask you if you'd please hold your applause till I get through it, but you need to hear the folks who, uh, uh, somebody and I were talking, I think Teresa and I were talking about me thanking them for their support, and you know, there are a lot of great things to support. These people don't have to support this, but they chose to see this as an important endeavor. So listen to these people, please solicit their businesses. <laughs> But thank them when I get done with, for their support. Our gold sponsors are the Art Museum and Miller Coors. Our silver sponsor, AARP. The bronze sponsors, the Carter Health Foundation. The Carter Trust, and I'm proud to be a new trustee on the Carter Trust Board. The Carter Housing and Finance Authority. Dr. Cog, Pasco, and Wells Fargo. Please, thank those sponsors. I also want to acknowledge the board members of the LCFC who are here. Um, first, Ron Montoya, who told me not to tell secrets about him. Ron Montoya, Adriana, Adriana Abarca, Radine Acevedo, Luis Colon, Mitchell Gonzalez, Debbie Ortega, Gary Poling, and Gloria Rubio Cortez. Please acknowledge those folks. Ra raise your hand, everybody. Where are our board members? Okay. Thank you, thank you. Let's say, since when are Latinos a shy lot? Okay, well then let's let the founding board members stand up and be proud, okay? So there are six of our founding board members here. All of those of you who are the, the fathers and mothers of this endeavor, why don't you guys stand? I think one of you, please stand and let's acknowledge you guys. Where are, where are you, the men and women who started this? Ron, where is everybody? Adriana, Luis, okay, thank you all. Thank you, bless you, bless you. Now it's my pleasure to uh, not only introduce, but also welcome to Colorado and to, to this whole uh, wonderful uh, world of this supporting these great endeavors. But Gloria Schock from Miller Coors is gonna come up and, and say a few words. And Gloria, I wanna thank you for your support and welcome you to the podium. And thank all of you again for coming.
Thank you for the introduction, Don. Good afternoon, everyone. What a great crowd. It's wonderful to see so many Latino leaders all in one room. As Don mentioned, I'm Gloria Schock of Miller Coors. So hasn't this been such a great forum? Yes. It's been a unique opportunity for all of us to share ideas, stretch our perspective on issues affecting our Latino elders, and come together to have meaningful dialogue about where we are today and where we're headed collectively as a community. Like LCFC, we at Miller Coors recognize the important role that Latinos play in shaping the future of our country. Because of that, we've been committed to improving educational and economic opportunities for Latinos. Miller Corps partners with organizations that help advance communities by making long-term investments that build strong partnerships and where the impact can be deep and wide-reaching. Our new economic empowerment partnership with LCFC is multifaceted. It touches upon building local leadership and expanding economic opportunities for families at many levels. Miller Corps believes that organizations like LCFC are critical in the Latino community. They help raise consciousness and awareness of a community across generations and across so many areas. They contribute to our long-term health and sustainability and inspire people to get engaged, connected, and reach their full potential. I just want to thank Carlos Martinez, the LCFC Board of Directors, the Rose Community Foundation for the work they do day in, day out to strengthen our neighborhoods and our state. I'd also like to acknowledge all of the organizations and Latino professionals who are here today. Thank you for making a difference through your hard work, leadership, and commitment to our community. We are very happy and honored to be here today and proud to be supporters and partners of such an important organization. So in closing, Miller Coors would like to present LCFC with a $100,000 gift to support their economic work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're very excited about the partnership. Um, over th so the funds will be used over the next three years to fund programs that will help inspire Latinos to find career tracks that will help contribute to our state's economic success. I'd also like to encourage other companies in the room to support LCFC's invaluable work so that we can have a greater collective impact in transforming Latinos' lives in our state. So, and with that, I'd like to um, Tell Ron Montoya to please come up to the stage. I know he had a couple comments that he'd, he'd like to share before we do the check presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. I just want to say I want to thank many individuals, and particularly Miller Coors, for their support and their investment in our community. I want to thank Yolanda Quesada, who, along with John Ortiz, did tremendous work to develop this relationship with Miller Coors. And it's not just a $100,000 investment in our community, it's a long-term relationship that we're going through here for the betterment of our community in the state of Colorado. So I just wanted to thank Miller Coors for their tremendous support of our community, and John, Yolanda, everyone involved did a wonderful job and we will continue working hard to make our community better for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, John. Thank you, Miller Coors, for your support. Um, very appreciative of that. And we'll be able to go ahead and use that in communities throughout Colorado. Um, I would now like to invite Sheila Bogdanowitz, the CEO President of the Rose Community Foundation. It was Sheila's, Elsa's, and a few others' vision to really think that, you know what, we need a Latino Community Foundation here in the state of Colorado. When I came to work uh, here at the Latino Community Foundation, of course I did a little bit of my homework. And you know, there's very few 
Latino community foundations in the country. I can count them on this hand. There's a lot of Latino funds, but very few foundations. So I am very grateful for Sheila's leadership in birthing the foundation. Thank you very much, Sheila. Thank you, Carlos. And it's really uncomfortable between, to be between a $100,000 gift and a former, um, oh goodness, a former Surgeon General. I mean, it's, I'm gonna have to work on getting my place in these programs a little different. So I am Sheila Bogdanowitz. I've been um, with Rose Community Foundation for 15 years. The foundation was created in 1995 when Rose Medical Center was sold. And Rose Medical Center was created a year before um, Dr. Carmona was born. At, at an interesting time in, this is just post-war, a really interesting time in our country's history. Um, and I tell you about this because many of the values of Rose Community Foundation really came from Rose Medical Center that was created by the Jewish community um, to allow Jewish doctors who at the time did not have equal practice privileges at local hospitals. That also meant that doctors of color did not have practice privileges. In fact, were not allowed to be in the American Medical Association. Um, the first African-American doctor was uh, admitted on staff at Rose Hospital, so the first in the state admitted was in Rose Hospital, at Rose Hospital in the 1950s. So, so that sort of history of discrimination is something that um, it's a value that, that Rose Community Foundation has to this day. Um, so when there was so much um, anti-immigrant rhetoric in Colorado and probably other parts of the country in the early to, early to mid-2000s, many of us at the foundation said, look, we have resources, we, ha we can influence change, what can we do to change this? T tackling immigration was way too big and that was something at a federal level, but we really felt that what we could do is somehow highlight all the positives in the Latino community. And the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado was born and launched in 2007. We've been so, so proud of what um, Elsa Holguin um, and I, actually, I think it was the two of us, and Carolyn Waller joined us as we thought about what this could look like. And so we had this fuzzy vision. Um, it wasn't very clear, it wasn't very clean, it wasn't totally articulated, um, but we felt it had great potential. And guess what we're seeing today? We're seeing potential in action. And this is the vision that we didn't have that the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado is creating for itself. And I'm just so, so proud to be part of that. Um, and now it's my privilege. to introduce an exceptional man. And I told him just before, before I came up that um, he and I share, uh, our beginnings are similar. Because I was born into an, a very poor immigrant family as was Dr. Carmona. Um, but our paths took very, very different directions after that. Uh, he was born in New York City. I'm from Denver. He experienced homelessness, hunger, and health disparities in his youth, and probably those experiences in influenced the rest of his life. He dropped out of high school. He enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1967, that's Vietnam time, um, and received his GED while in the service. He left uh, the military as a decorated Special Forces veteran. He then went on to pursue a college degree 
and entered medical school at the University of California in San Francisco. He became a surgeon, so that wasn't just medical school. Then there was um, the surgery part. And he later uh, established the first trauma system in southern Arizona. So while being a doctor and doing all kinds of fabulous work for community, um, he started his second or maybe third career. And that is that he went back to school and got a master's in public health policy and administration at the University of Arizona. In 2002, he became the 17th Surgeon General of the United States. Unbelievable, right? <laughs> When you talk about resilience, I think it's written all over him. Um, he completed his four-year term. He then joined Tucson-based Canyon Ranch as vice chairman. He is uh, currently president of the nonprofit Canyon Ranch Institute and distinguished professor at the University of Arizona. This is one remarkable man. Welcome, Dr. Carmona. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Sheila, thank you for the nice introduction, but I, I often feel like uh, Ricky used to say to Lucy, you got a lot of explaining to do now. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't engender a lot of uh, support from your peers when they find out their Surgeon General is a high school dropout. <laughs> of course, many of you just think after all that, it, well, it's just another federal appointee, what's the big deal? Well. I'm thrilled to be here with you for many of the reasons that you've heard already. But what strikes me is that having the opportunity as Surgeon General of the United States to not only travel the country but the world, um, I've never seen an organization like this. I've seen many Hispanic organizations. I've, I've not seen anybody pull together a community around the needs of the viejitos, the elders in the community. And I think that's a wonderful, wonderful testament to the culture and all that the elders have left us with, the legacy of culture, the legacy of work ethic, the legacy of integrity, of family that is there. And I know you all appreciate that as much as I do because it made a big, a big, big difference in my life as well. So I'd like to talk to a little today on the uh, uniqueness of the Latino aging in America. But first and foremost, uh, give thanks to the Latino Community Foundation for the privilege of being among all of you who are so passionately involved in policy and programs that will support the aging Hispanic community here in Colorado. Congratulations to the Colorado Latino Age Wave Initiative, which I just thought was fantastic when I read about the history, and evolving now to the Colorado Lateral, uh, excuse me, the Colorado uh, Aging Resource Center. You know, one of the things that I've recognized through all the years, especially as being Surgeon General and, and going to so many communities like this, is that what makes our nation so strong is the diversity. Yet the paradox is it's what separates us also. And it creates the struggles that are still ongoing today, Sheila recounted, and being a historical buff myself and, and learning a lot of history from my own abuelita as I grow up, which I'll, I'll tell you about. But there's still a great, great deal of inequalities. There's still a great deal of covert discrimination, if you will, and, and inherent biases even from people who don't realize that they are biased in their decision making. And it's really organizations like this that shine a light on those discriminatory practices and allow the true people to emerge and really take their earned seat in society. So again, my applause to all of you for what you're doing. Now, a little bit about being Surgeon General. As you heard my background, um, I was one of four children uh, of immigrant parents who spoke English as a second language. My abuelita, who brought the whole family in, never spoke English her whole life. She died in her 80s. Toughest woman I ever met with the most integrity, about five foot two, 100 pounds soaking wet, and was just the most fantastic person. And I never realized in growing up how much she would affect my later life. Because as a child, you know, it's, it's abuelita, you know? And I grew up at a time when there was a great deal of discrimination. I grew up in a neighborhood called Harlem in New York City. 
And so what, if you stayed in your hood, things were okay because everybody looked like us. They were all brown or black. But when you stepped out of the hood, there was a great deal of discrimination. And so most of my generation as we grew up, we didn't speak Spanish. My father was the youngest of 27 kids. Yeah, Abuelita was a saint, I told you. <laughs> and I had every one of my tios y tias, they spoke Spanish. And Abuelita lived in this little tenement. And on Sundays, she'd cook all day and feed everybody. And they all lived in the same area, but they'd come in and they'd pay homage to Abuelita, who was the matriarch of the family. I mean, she was truly the queen of the family. Now, Abuelo thought he was, but that's only because Abuelita let him believe he was. <laughs> she really controlled the family. But often it was my Abuelita who said to me, after she would ask me questions and I'd, I'd respond in English. And she'd say, Ricardo, si quiere dinero, necesita que pida mi en español. <laughs> Ricardo, si tiene hambre, necesita que pida mi en español. Meaning, if you want money, you got to talk to me in Spanish. You want food, you have to talk to me in Spanish. And that, I was really upset with that because I knew out in the streets that wasn't helping me because of the discrimination that we all faced during those years in the 50s and the 60s. But yet, as I aged, I recognized how smart she really was because she never wavered from who she was and how proud she was to be a Hispanic immigrant in America. Never once wavered. And in fact, always told me, be proud of who you are. Don't hide from it because you can be as good as anybody else. Education will set you free. So with that background and a mom whose goal in life, mom spoke in Spanglish. And she would often say, I just want to live long enough to go to one of my kids' graduations. And all she meant was high school because nobody in the family had been out of high school. Yet she worked hard. She had problems with substance abuse. My father did as well. We were homeless. We ran the streets. Tios y tias took us in. Friends took us in. But it was a very uncertain life. So I wasn't a good student because as you know, even today, when a child doesn't have a stable environment, when they don't have a loving family, when they don't know where they're gonna be sleeping every night, homework is not an issue. Survival is an issue. And yet, in our country today, 20% of children grow up in poverty. Almost half the children in the United States will be in some type of a support program, local, state, or federal, by the time they reach adolescence. This is the greatest nation, most rich nation in the world, and our most precious resource is struggling. And the responsibility we have, and I felt as Surgeon General this tremendous burden was every birth is an opportunity to create a success story. And if we don't, that birth becomes a liability to society. And we pay for that liability for decades to come, for a whole lifetime. So you heard my out at 17 years old with no place to go was joining the army. And the army taught me a lot, not just to be a good soldier, but it taught me about duty and honor and, co and country. The recruiter, when they recruited me at 17 at the peak of the war where I had no place to go, said, son, if you sign the paper, we're gonna make you all you can be. And he wasn't lying. I had no idea what I was in store for. But yet it was a transformative experience in my life because for the first time in my life, I was being really held accountable. My abuelita and my mom tried, but you know, we didn't listen much. Obviously, they weren't as smart as we were at that age. But like Mark Twain said, he said, I can't believe how smart my father became when I was 21. I feel the same way about my mom and abuelita who struggled. And my pop, who was a good man, but had a life in the street. And he struggled as well. And the kids kind of were on their own a lot of times, even though mom did the best she could. So that event changed my life, but my success eventually, after multiple failures, because really the only difference between a person that succeeds and fails is the person that succeeds gets up one more time. My success is really a testament to this great country who still struggles and has problems and blemishes, but it is still the best country in the world, where opportunity abounds for anybody 
If you want to work a little harder, if you want to stay up a little later, if you want to get up a little earlier, if you want to be an innovator, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to take some risk, this is the place to do it. Few places in the world can you be born to poverty, homelessness, poor education, and then become the Surgeon General of the United States. It's a great country. As you heard, I always had a plan A and plan B, but I kept working hard. I've worked a lot of jobs in my life. As you know, I've been a soldier, I've been a police officer, I've been a paramedic, a registered nurse, a physician's assistant, teacher, ocean lifeguard. So you're all thinking, well, hell, this is just a guy that couldn't keep a job. <laughs> Yet, every one of those jobs was extraordinarily important when I ultimately became the Surgeon General of the United States as we embarked on two wars as we were dealing with everything from avian flu to SARS and all the other problems, including obesity and the public health issues of the day. Getting there was a real challenge. As I got through my tour in Vietnam, I never thought that I was gonna leave the Army. I thought I was gonna make the Army Special Forces a career because I'd been promoted. I had a position of leadership. I was wounded in combat, but I made it back. A lot of my friends didn't, and that still weighs heavily on me. It's painful to go to the wall and see the 58,000 names, and I know on each panel where all of my buddies were. But yet I was fortunate to come back, so what the driver was, what am I gonna do with this opportunity? And as I dwelled on that, and I had my GED, I thought, Maybe I should go to college, but to be honest with you, my plan was to stay in the military because it was a safe place for the first time in my life. I had a job, I got three squares, I got to see the world, but my team in Special Forces kept saying, you need to go to college, Carmona. I was a Special Forces medic and a weapons specialist, and I knew that I couldn't get in because I'd not done SATs or PSATs, and it was embarrassing. It was humbling, quite frankly, but after a while, they kept pushing me, and I said, all right, I'm going to apply. And the only reason was it was a strategic plan. I knew when I applied they were going to reject me, and then they would stop bothering me, and I would just stay in the Army. <laughs> and I applied to dozens of schools, and I got the rejection letters, which was humbling, because everybody thought, well, you're a pretty good guy in the Army. How, how could they reject you? But they didn't know my background. And for many years, I never spoke about it, because I was embarrassed. And then one day, the letter came in from a community college, Bronx Community College in New York, and it said, congratulations, you've been accepted. I was, oh shit, I gotta go to college now. <laughs> and I went and it was humbling because the first year you just take remedial courses. And I sat with smart kids and I wasn't that good a student because I had to do everything that I hadn't done before and including learn how to study. But eventually I became an A student, working all those jobs and eventually I moved out west, finished college there, graduated at the top of my class, and I was fortunate that I applied to a lot of medical schools and I got into several. And I chose University of California in San Francisco because it was the most diverse medical school in the country. It was 1976. For those of you who know San Francisco, the medical school sits right adjacent to Haight-Ashbury and there. So there was always a cloud over the medical school. Everybody was happy. <laughs> Everybody was happy. But at a time when you didn't see much equality for, for women, a third of our medical school class were women. Had the highest rate of Hispanics in the country in medical school. Diversity was a big priority for the University of California early on. And I thought, I feel at home here. So I went and I worked hard and I never got into the, the stress that all the normal kids in medical school have because medical students always complain, there's too much to work, there's too hard, there's too many books, I'm never gonna make it. Th then they kind of form these little groups and they feed off of one another. And, and it, becomes, it becomes very stressful. I never did that because to me, this wasn't stress. These kids didn't know what real stress was like. And I went to classes and then after a while I didn't go, I just read the syllabus and I, stopped, I was very focused and regimented and disciplined, skills I learned in the Army. 
And because of that, I skipped my last year of medical school and I graduated number one in my class at the University of California. <laughs> and you heard I, my colleagues in, in nursing and paramedicine and everything uh, often chided me because I became a surgeon and really because they said, well, when you ask a surgeon to name the best three surgeons in the world, they always have trouble naming the other two. <laughs> and I became a trauma surgeon, but I kept working. In fact, even when I was a, a doc, I was still working as a police officer because I, I loved that emergency response and community stuff that I was doing, and I didn't let it go. But during that time, I went back to graduate school, as you heard, and then I got a call one night, and um, it was White House personnel. And they said, Dr. Carmona, would you uh, like to be considered for a job in uh, Washington? Would you be willing to go back on active duty back in uniform? And I called and I thought, well, obviously this is a mistake, this call. There's another Rich Carmona in the country because there's no reason for the White House to call me. I have been pretty critical of both parties and the poor, and the poor I should say lack of leadership and poor leadership that's exemplified by both parties. I've actually been bipartisan, but in a way that has been uh, maybe incriminating to both parties. <laughs> so there, the point is there was no reason for them to call me because I didn't, I didn't call in any favors. But when I talked to the young man the next day and he said, well, I, I said, well, what's the job? He says, the president will be recruiting for a new United States Surgeon General. We'd like to know if you'd like to be considered. And I kind of laughed and said, okay, fine. But I knew that in a couple of weeks, they'll figure out they got the wrong guy and I'll get sent home. But I thought, there's no downside. I'm gainfully employed. I'm a professor at the university. I'm teaching. I'm doing all these things. And I did it. And eventually, I went through the process, which is a very intrusive process and sometimes malicious. As you know, when you become a public figure, you start being you know, incriminated and related to crimes that occurred before you were born. <laughs> it becomes a circus. It's not, a pro it's not really professional vetting. It becomes a circus and a feeding frenzy. And you all should be concerned about that because when I was Surgeon General and I was trying to recruit smart young men and women, especially to exemplify diversity, especially in the Hispanic community, I had people tell me, yeah, I'd like it, but I won't go through that crap that you went through. We lose as a society because the system has become so malicious and such an entertainment tonight kind of an event that people are not willing to serve selflessly anymore and we lose because we don't get to the good, diverse representation that we deserve. We need to fix that system, folks. <laughs> so, I'll finish up on this part. During the process of all these phone interviews, I had put a little card in my pocket and I had written out because I knew that I was going to get rejected on one of the calls. And I got through several calls. And then uh, they said, well, Dr. Carmona, would you be willing to come to Washington and interview? I said, are you guys paying? And they said, yeah. So I had a little card in my I, I wrote this little card out. I called it my rejection speech with dignity. Because I knew they were going to reject me. And I knew when I got rejected, I wanted to have something positive to say. And the calls just came in randomly because it's not like the White House schedules anything. And so the statement was essentially saying, thank you for your consideration. Please let the president know I'm willing to come back on active duty if there are other leadership positions, and I appreciate this opportunity. I always had it in my pocket. So I start going through meetings with the famous people in Washington, secretaries and such, and finally, uh, after a couple of months, I get a call, and it's the White House chief of staff. So my secretary called me, I pick up the phone, I took out my card. And I, was, I, I knew that this was gonna be the rejection part that, you know, for 10 minutes they'll tell you how, what a great American you are, but the last 30 seconds is, but we're gonna accept somebody else. And he said, Richard, I said, yes, Mr. Secretary. He said, um, what are you doing on March 26th? And I said, okay, it's another interview. He said, no, um, I really wanna know what you and your family are doing on the 26th. And I thought, oh, hell, they want to interview my kids. I will never get this job. <laughs> and he says, Richard, um, hang on a second. He said, I, I should have told you. The president just met with the leadership. The president has made his decision. He'd like you and your family to come to the White House on March 26th, where he will 
announced to the nation that you will be the nominee for Surgeon General of the United States. And I said something brilliant. I said, you're shitting me. <laughs> and, and he said, no, sir, I'm not. <laughs> so your life changes. You become a public figure overnight. And eventually, you're, you go through the second part. Because you're not Surgeon General. Basically, the president nominates you. It's really Congress that gives you the permission to serve, the Senate confirmation. That's another intrusive, malicious process that you should be aware of. And eventually, it was good for me, but I, I will tell you that a lot of people I know, uh, and I've met, won't subject them and their families. Because remember, it's not only you going through the process. Everybody that's around your circle, social circle, is involved in this process. And so your kids' names get dragged through the papers. Your, any indiscretions you had, uh, you know, whatever it happens to be, and most of the things really never occurred, but people link disparate e evidence together. In any event, I made it and um, went through the processes, and then um, you wait because there's three paths when you get nominated by the president for a very high-level position. You can get a confirmation hearing and then be kind of treated like a pinata in public and wish you didn't get the hearing. You can be ignored and die waiting on the list, which happens to many presidential nominees. And that's the way the Congress tells the president, we don't like your nominee. Or you can be like me and get a hearing. And you, don't, you get the hearing after meeting individually with dozens of senators. And I got the call, it says, come to the White House, come to the, uh, to the Capitol, and at 9 a.m. on this day, you're going to have your Senate confirmation hearing for Surgeon General of the United States. So I got there about 10 minutes early, I was pacing in the Senate ante room, I was diaphoretic, I was tachycardic, <laughs> I was, I thought, oh my God, I mean, for the, if there's any docs in the audience or people who have, take, have to take boards, the Senate confirmation process is like taking your boards in public, okay? C-SPAN is there, ABC, NBC, every media outlet's there. And sure, they want to report on the news, but they're really looking for a YouTube moment. Okay, they want you to go off script, and that's the headline for tomorrow. So I showed up at the hearing, and a very wonderful senator who I had met, who had befriended me through the process, came out to meet me. And I never used to use his name, but his family, I know very well, and they said it's fine. And it was Senator Ted Kennedy. And Teddy, Teddy gave me a hug, and he said, I want to thank you for your willingness to serve again. And, uh, but I want to also tell you that, um, you know, these hearings often are very partisan. And my colleagues may ask you questions that make no sense to you. They may grandstand at your expense. Just remember it's politics. It's not personal. Because you happen to be the platform of the day. I said, okay, Senator, I get it. So he gave me a hug, and he was holding my hand. And he says, but I want to give you a piece of Advice that may help you. And he looked at me kind of in an odd way. And, and the best way I could describe that look is the look I had after I, have my, I hugged my son when I sent him off to Iraq on his first tour. This look of, you really know what you're doing? <laughs> and he said, Richard, I want to tell you something. I said, Senator, anything you can tell me today that will help me get through this arduous process would be greatly appreciated. He said, it won't help you today. He said, but if you get through, and I think you might, because I've asked around, and you did pretty well in all your interviews. I said, okay, Senator, what is it? But he kept talking. He was very reticent. He said, all right, I'm going to tell you. He said, you've probably heard this before, but you can't understand it. I said, well, what is it, Senator? He said, Rich, when you come to Washington, if you want a friend, you need to bring a dog. <laughs> and I said, Senator, I've heard that before. I think it was Harry Truman who said that. And I looked at him in the eye and I said, I understand. He looked me in the eye, kind of hugging me with a show, and he looked me in the eye and he said, you are clueless. <laughs> I was clueless because there's nothing that prepares you for the combat zone we know as the Beltway. Nothing. I felt more vulnerable in the Beltway than I did in combat, to be honest with you. And I told the president that many times and he said, welcome to the club. We went out. I had my Senate confirmation hearing. It took a little over two hours, which is light speed in Washington, and I became the first Surgeon General in the history of the United States to be confirmed unanimously by the U.S. Senate.
A couple of years later, I was up on the hill, and I Surgeon generals testify all the time about different things, and it was a terrorism meeting. And in this, it was late, we were a little delayed, and I was chit-chatting with the senators. I went over to Senator Kennedy, and every time I saw him, I always thanked him for how grace, grateful I was for his graciousness in taking me under his wing, and a few other senators as well, but to help me understand the process. And I, I went over to him again, I said, Senator, I just want to tell you again, thank you for the opportunity, thank you. He says, Rich, we're happy to have you back in uniform, you're doing a great job. I said, no, no, but thank you for the advice, Senator. He said, what advice? You mean the dogs? I said, yeah, the dogs. And he smiled and he said, you understand now. I said, Senator, I do understand. I'm a smart street kid, I've been here a couple of years. I said, but I respectfully disagree with you. He said, well, how can you disagree? I don't understand that. I said, well, Senator, I've been here a couple of years now. I learned the ropes, and it's come to my attention that if you come to Washington, you need to bring at least two dogs with you. <laughs> and, and he said, I don't understand. Well, why? I said, because during your tenure, one of those dogs will turn on you. <laughs> and he laughed, and he gave me a hug, and he said, damn, that's better advice than I gave you. Can I use it? I said, use it, use it, use it. Well, the Surgeon General's job is pretty easy. Protect, promote, and advance the health, safety, and security of the United States. On paper, extraordinarily easy. When you try and execute in a hyper-partisan political environment, it's nearly impossible to get things done with any gracefulness or in any expediency because of all of the things that you all know and read about every day. And yet, the Surgeon General has a unique position in our history. The position goes back to 1798 when President Adams created the Marine Hospital Service and he evolved then to become the Surgeon General in the U.S. Public Health Service. But what's interesting is when you do polling, usually the Surgeon General, when you look at polling involving the Surgeon General, turns out to be the most credible, visible person in the federal government. And why? Because you never see the Surgeon Generals getting indicted for anything, okay? You know, they're not, they're not in sexual escapades or stealing money or doing stupid things because they recognize their job is not to be the doctor of the Republican or the Democratic Party. You have a more important job. Your job is to be the doctor of the people of the United States, and it rises well above politics. Because as I used to say as a trauma surgeon, when I was in the trauma room and they'd call and have gunshot wounds coming in, or when I was in combat, nobody comes in on their stretcher at the, at just before they die and asking for a Republican or a Democratic trauma surgeon. They want somebody who's gonna fix them, period. And through it all, in the history of our Surgeon Generals, all of us have managed to rise above the political fray, and it's tough to stay focused on what the people, excuse me, on what the people need. The Surgeon General has to develop a portfolio, and the portfolio is important. First, number one, prevention. We're a nation that is drowning in a lot of disease and economic burden that we cause. Tobacco, obesity, and so on. Why is it important to you as Hispanic leaders? Because Hispanic populations are disproportionately represented in obesity, okay? In smokers, a whole host of things. So when you break out the demographics, you start to see the Latino community being disproportionately represented with this disease burden. And there's a lot of reasons for that that go beyond the scope of this. Lack of health literacy, uh, cultural competence issues, access to care, transportation, they're, they're very complex. But the bottom line is, for the people you are concerned with, the viejitos, the seniors in the Hispanic community, they are disadvantaged because they carry generally a greater disease and economic burden, and they have less resources to deal with that. So it was a passionate thing of mine because health disparities and all that stuff, I understand it now, but I lived that. I know what it's like to go to bed hungry. I know what it's like to be homeless. I know what it's like to be wondering where the next meal or where the next bed's gonna come from. And we still live in the richest country in the world that has those problems. That's the problem. So as I um, look at the portfolio prevention, preparedness, we're a nation that was fighting two wars at the time. And when we look at the disease and economic burden, including obesity, they become national security issues. Do you know that for the first time in our history, the Army had to establish a pre-induction boot camp because there were not enough healthy kids to get into the Army? They had to put them through pretty much a finishing school for obesity so they could pass their PT test to get into the Army. That still exists today. And yet, the Hispanic community is disproportionately in that cohort. And yet, our history in the military is incredible. We serve in every war. In my family, my, going back to my grandfather, my father, my tios, myself, my brother, all served in combat. We have three generations of Carmonas, and we see that in Hispanics. 
Once they're here, they have this sense of community and they serve because their country asks them to serve. It's real common. So prevention, preparedness, the issue of health disparities. Probably nowhere more in our country do you see this issue of the health disparities. The fact that disease burden is disproportionately represented in people of color. Hispanics we're talking about today, but in African Americans, and the greatest health disparities in our nation. Believe it or not, not where I grew up in Harlem or East LA in the African American community, or even down by the border in Nogales or Texas. The greatest dis disparities in our nation today are in the original Americans, the Native Americans. Go to a reservation and forget you're in the United States and the health metrics look like a third world country. Suicide rates, dropout rates, divorce rates, domestic violence, the list is endless, what we call the social determinants of health, and it's right in our backyard. And the challenge, of course, is that for all of these health disparities, when I was Surgeon General, they become political. People would say, come on up, you're too liberal. Those people need to get jobs. Well, hell, if it was that easy, they would, okay? It's not that easy. It's very difficult. And the fact of the matter is, when I look at the Hispanic community, knowing from my own, my own family, from my 27 tios, tias, who all worked in service industry, the, my aunts, planchados, who ironing somebody's clothes, maids, the guys working in labor and construction, all became great citizens, paid taxes, lived in little apartments, never owned a car, never took a vacation, but their focus, those viejitos, was get the kids an education and help them assume leadership in this great country to show the world how important it is to have a diverse, especially Hispanic community. Because like my abuelita used to say to me, Richard, you should be proud of who you are because the United States wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Hispanic explorers. This is a lady who had a third grade education. She could really be, barely read a newspaper, but she never wavered on how important Hispanic culture was. So when I look at prevention, preparedness, health disparities, and some of the challenges we have in the Latino community today, one of them that comes up is this compliance issue. When you look at the data, you hear doctors all the time and say, well, these patients are not compliant. They didn't follow the instructions. They didn't take their medicine. Well, you know, you hear it all the time. If you're poor and you can only afford one medicine, you start splitting the pills, okay? You start eating food that normal people don't eat because you're trying to make ends meet. And so what we find out with compliance is often it is not that the person on the other side, in this case a Hispanic, doesn't want to be compliant, but they have no other choice. And I'll give you an example. I had a big resuscitation one day and an elderly Hispanic lady came in. We didn't know what happened to her, but she was having a heart attack. We brought her in, resuscitated her. I spoke to her niece who brought her in. She was in her 60s. She looked older. She looked like she had worked hard her whole life. I said, what happened? She said, I don't know. She said, but, but my, you know, Tia has been very depressed and she forgot to take her medicine the last five days and she knew she had to go see her doctor tomorrow, so she just took all the pills she missed this morning. That's a lack of health literacy, but because of that, she almost died. And those kind, of, those kind of cases are magnified throughout the Hispanic community, especially in the older people. Why? I look at my own, my own abuelita. When she, she, she practiced herbal medicine, as probably many of you know, historically. When we got a fever, she had the witch hazel on the feet, she had herbs, she had all this stuff. And you know what? Most of the time we got better. We call it complementary and alternative medicine today. If Abuelita was still alive, she'd tell you it ain't complimentary. This is what my people have done for generations. However, when she had to go to a doctor at a social security office, she'd take little Richie with her. So I'm her interpreter. And she goes to the doctor and she's 70 something years old and I'm a 10 year old kid. How likely is it she's gonna tell me she's got a vaginal discharge or a breast bump or something? So that still happens today, many of you know. There's a lack of translation because of the cultural gap. And I remember that very well from when I was a little kid. Every, everything always seemed to be okay. So let's look at the profile of Hispanic older, Amer uh, older America in, in America today. In 2008, we had about 2.7 million senior Hispanics. In 2050, it will be 17 million. 20% of the older population will be senior Hispanics. 70% of Hispanics live in four states, California, Texas, Florida, New York. The educational level of older Hispanics is generally much less than Anglo seniors. Hispanic elders tend to stay more connected with family, as many of you who are Latinos here know. 
Hispanic elders tend to have lower incomes and higher rates of unemployment. Poverty rates for Hispanic seniors are about 20%, more than twice the rate for non-Hispanic Anglos. Hispanic seniors tend to have a much less vaccination rate. Hispanic seniors have less access to medical care and prevention services. Generally, have lower benefits, if any at all, at retirement. These are collectively what we call the social determinants of health. Not all of them, it's not an all-inclusive list, but these are the issues that determine how you're going to do in life, what's your chance of success. And in fact, the greatest indicator of health status in the world and the potential for life success is socioeconomic status. If you can't get an education, if you can't be competitive, I don't care if you're in Sub-Saharan Africa or if you're in Bangladesh or if you're in Puerto Rico or the Dominican Republic or Mexico, that holds true globally. So education, being able to raise yourself up, economics are so, so important for this population. As one of uh, the most important things I learned as Surgeon General was the one degree I needed to be a more effective Surgeon General after having gone through college and gotten a bunch of degrees and going back to graduate school after I was a doctor, the one degree I really recognized I needed was anthropology because ultimately all this stuff comes down to culture and understanding the diversity in our country. Many people. I used to sit at meetings in the White House and the executive office building at HHS and such and they would say, well, let's talk about what we're going to do for the Hispanic people today. I said, because they lump us together as one. Kind of, you know, you're all brown, you speak Spanish, but yet I can remember living in the hood where I first learned about diversity. And it, there were funny stories because Abuelita would, you know, we'd have the Cubans and the Dominicans and the Puerto Ricans, you know. But when somebody other than where you came from came into the neighborhood, Abuelita would be out there saying, God damn, the Dominicans are here now. The neighbors, the place is going to go to hell, you know. And, and the Cubans, you know, and they'd say the same thing about us. But you start to see that the diversity is really incredible. We all have a common ancestry, but then if you follow as the migrations occurred from Spain and the, and the cultures that we intersected with, we all became very different. So Cubanos and Puerto Ricans and, and Colombianos and, and Mexicanos are all, they, they're the same, but they're different. And as providers and as leaders in the community, we have to recognize that rich diversity because one size doesn't fit all in programs and messaging. It does not make it. Our job is to be able to take the tough stuff that we know, science, whatever it happens to be, translate it in a culturally competent, health literate manner to do one thing only, effect sustainable behavioral change in the population we have responsibility for. Simple equation, extraordinarily difficult to execute because of that diversity, which is why I said, I really would have been a better Surgeon General had I had a degree in anthropology because I had enough science, I had enough of the business side, I understood it, but taking this stuff into all of these diverse communities which is representative of the United States and trying to get people engaged and then change their behaviors don't smoke, walk more, eat less, you know, whatever it happens to be, it ain't that easy. It ain't that easy. So it's extraordinarily important. So what I learned is my background has probably informed me and prepared me better to be a Surgeon General of the United States than any degree I ever had. But those degrees helped because now I understood what I had intuitively learned as a child, growing up in a very diverse community, in a poor Hispanic family, understanding all those socioeconomic, th socioeconomic issues. So what is it that we know today? Hisp Hispanics are the fastest growing minority ethnic group in the United States. Hispanic elders generally are health illiterate. I'm not picking on my, my people. The general US population as, as a whole, over half of them are health illiterate. But it's more disproportionately evident in the Hispanic community. They don't understand the science and what they need to do to pursue optimal health and wellness. Health illiteracy. Hispanic elders tend to underutilize health and social services. Hispanic seniors have poor access to transportation in general. They distrust outsiders, especially government. There's a cultural clash of the viejitas or Hispanic elders in this new digital world with a value system that they're now immersed in, a culture of social media and painfully different values. They no longer feel that they are relevant in society. That's a big issue for our seniors in, these, in our communities now. Relevance, because they come from a world where abuelo or abuelita were the kings and queens. And the kids never thought about putting them in a nursing home or assisted living. That was the family responsibility. And I'll give you a quick example. 
few years back, I had taken my kids to Mexico. I was down by the Mayan ruins, and I was in this little village. And everybody wanted to see the sites, but I was attracted to this little bunch of stands where they were selling souvenirs. And right at the end was this little viejita in a rocking chair. And she reminded me of my abuelita. And I wanted to go meet her. So I said, you guys go do what you want to do. So I sat down, and very delicately, I wanted to ask her how old she was. But you know, that's a bad thing to ask, uh, you know, a Latina. So, so I... I spent five or ten minutes before I would ask, telling her how beautiful she was and how beautiful the home was, you know, and talking. But I was really into trying to figure out who she was and what she does. And she's walking on the chair, and I said, so, how old? 106. And I said, wow. I said, how long have you lived here? She said, I was born here, right in that house. I said, who are all these people here running the little stands? They're my kids, my grandkids, and my great-grandkids. Really? And while I'm there for that half hour talking to her, Every one of those generation kids were running up. Awalita, can I do this? Awalita, what time are we having dinner? Awalita, what about this? She had a purpose for living. She was the matriarch of the family. She wasn't put out to pasture. She was looked at for her wisdom. They all came seeking her guidance. And she sat in the throne. And I said, well, tell me about your day. They have a little farm around this place. She gets up every day. She picks her vegetables. She plants stuff. She's physically active. She's socially connected. The things that we often forget about that add to longevity in the so-called blue zones. When you find societies, especially up in the Mediterranean, that people live for long periods, especially over 100 years old, that's the missing link. That they're socially connected, that they have relevance to continue living, that they're not put in a corner and then put out the pasture. It's so important, this issue. So what do we need to do? I would say to all of you, you have created an extraordinary model here. You need to continue and progress progress in this group that you have formed that's addressing the needs of Latinos. I hope that this can be exported. I hope it can metastasize, if you will, around the country where it can be better. But remember, as your systems become more robust and complex, you potentially become further removed from the population that you serve as you become a bureaucracy. I've seen it for great people who try and do these things. So we have to embrace health literacy. That is, our ability to translate this complex, complex stuff to the pe very people that we have the privilege to serve, those viejitas out there, so that they understand, they engage, and they become motivated and aspire to what we aspire to, and that is to improve their health, to reduce the cost of health care, to eliminate the barriers of social inequities and injustices that are out there, and in doing so, we make life a lot better for those people who we own, owe our legacy to. Thank you very much. Wasn't he just wonderful? My God, yes. Unfortunately, he has a uh, plane to catch, so he wasn't able to spend much time with us after. But uh, the next part of our program is our Soul Award. Um, earlier this year, as our board was looking at um, how we end up recognizing our leadership, we decided to create an award called the Soul Award. SOL award. If you notice our logo, it has the sun on there. And so we decided to call the SOL award, which stands for Soul of Leadership, S-O-U-L of Leadership. And 
This award pays homage to a Latino leader who has demonstrated courageous leadership, embodies high standards of integrity, and has been deeply committed to the advancement of Latinos. And to present this award today is Patricia Barella Rivera and myself, who are going to go ahead and present this award to Irene Ibarra. Um, I'm going to have Patricia go first, and then I'll say some words after that. Thank you, Carlos. Buenas tardes. Y me da un, es un honor para mí estar aquí esta, esta tarde con ustedes. I'm truly honored to be able to share with you the amazing career and community accomplishments of one of my dearest and loving friends, Irene Ibarra, who I've known for approximately 34 years. And a lot of you in the audience, I probably know, have known Irene a lot longer. Irene received a BA in education, two masters, one in social work and one in public administration from the University of Denver. She also holds a law degree from the University of Washington and also attended Harvard University, the Kennedy School of Government for Senior Executives. Her career in the public and private sector are just as amazing as her educational accomplishments. Irene has more than 25 years as a chief executive, public policy leader, and health advocate. In talking to Irene, she's so very devoted from her heart to improve the health of low-income children and families, especially for our Latino and Latina communities. In 1987, Mayor Federico Peña appointed her to be the deputy manager of the Denver Department of Social Services. In 1991, Governor Roy Romer appointed her to be the executive director for the Colorado Department of Social Services. And if I'm not mistaken, she was the first Latina to be appointed to a governor's cabinet in Colorado. In 1995, Irene and her beloved husband, Armando, moved to Seattle, where she received her law degree and practiced corporate and business law at Martin Peterson Law Firm. In 1996, she became the chief executive officer for the Alameda Alliance for Health and also became the director for the Los Angeles Health Action Organization. In 2003, she became the executive vice president for the California Endowment, which was the statewide health foundation in California, where she oversaw a $1.4 billion budget. She returned to Denver and became the president and CEO of the Colorado Trust in 2007 which is one of the most prestigious and largest health foundations in Colorado, which focuses on achieving access to health for all Coloradoans. Irene has served on approximately 50 plus boards for the community. I can recall when she worked for the governor's office of labor and employment, and a lot of you know Sister Alicia Cuaron, and I went to Irene and asked her if she would support the first Colorado Training and Education Conference for Latinas, which was entitled Adelante Mujer Hispana, and a lot of you in the room will remember that. And she did not hesitate at all to help us. It was the first and only seed money we received back in 1980, and it was not very much money. The conference was successful, but what I wanna say it was not very much money at that time. But uh, again, um, the conference was successful. We had, for the first time in this state, we had a thousand Hispanic women attend that conference. This conference became the first national model for other Hispanic women's conferences held across the country. So thank you, Irene. You were a true visionary back in the 1980s. God bless you, that was wonderful for you to help us. Irene is one of those very, very special individuals in our lives that has always been an influential servant leader for the community. And I just want to share with you, if you look on this poster right here, 
Irene truly depicts that mission. It says, leadership, visionary, inspirational, and collaborative. And she depicts all of those attributes. It has not ever been uh, her agenda, but about, about her, it's not ever been about her. It's been about bettering the quality of life for the voiceless and the helpless. Her sincere passion and, help and heartfelt caring for people has been her number one priority her entire professional career. She's never wanted credit for her accomplishments, nor wanted to be in the limelight. She just wanted to do the job. That is why she's so very deserving of the Soul Award. She's not only a wonderful role model, mentor, community champion and hero, but one of the most intelligent, classiest, kindest, caring individuals I've had the pleasure of knowing in my life. We have laughed, we have cried. <laughs> Bear with me. We've danced, we've sang, we've cooked together, Irene, because she's a gourmet cook. She's taught me a lot and I've just enjoyed being her great friend. As many of you in this room feel the same way I do. Our community has been very blessed to have her in Colorado and because she's truly, truly made a significant difference in the lives of so many families and individuals. Irene, you're loved and respected by our Hispanic community. I love you and sincere congratulations, mi querida amiga. Thank you. Earlier today, I was talking about sharing your stories and how important it is to share your story because sometimes you have no idea who you will impact and an impact that sometimes will last a lifetime. Irene was one of those persons for me. I met Irene 12 years ago in Fresno, California. She was at the California Endowment and I was working for the James Irvine Foundation. And the James Irvine Foundation wanted to open an office in the Central Valley. And instead of creating a whole administrative infrastructure for that, we rented space for the, from the California Endowment. And quite often, Irene would come into town, and you knew when Irene was coming into town, okay? But she came in with such grace, with such integrity, and with such vision of what she wanted to have accomplished in the Central Valley that I used to just love when she would come in because I would always learn something from her. I know that our staff would go crazy because it's like she's coming in and we gotta do this, we gotta do that. But I wasn't part of the staff. I just got to sit back and observe her work, her magic as a leader. And that has stuck to me since then. I would never, ever would have dreamt that I would be up here presenting an award to Irene. Never, ever would have thought about that. Because when I first, I think I came to, I think we came to Denver about the same time. And um, never would I have thought that I would see her again. And not only just see her again, but she has become my mentor. Um, I'm starting to meet regularly with Irene and tap into that brilliant mind of hers and helping me to figure out how to strategize to move this foundation forward. I owe a lot to her because she gave me something that I needed. She gave me confidence, she gave me hope, she gave me that grace of how to go ahead and interact with people. Because there's one thing about also about Irene, she loves to make sure that everybody is at the table and that everybody is participating. She doesn't exclude anyone out. When I was talking to her, she, you know, I said, so what were some of your great accomplishments? She's, she said, it was, it was when I was at the Alameda uh, Healthcare Alliance. She goes, we started providing healthcare insurance 
for low-income families. And she goes, I was so moved and so touched when we would have a Latino family come in and say, here's my $10 for my health insurance. And this was years ago before we had the Affordable Care Act. She was making it possible to make sure that people had access. And to her, that meant so much to her. I'm also pleased to know that today, Irene is accompanied by her mother and her sisters and her brothers who have traveled here from out of state to see Irene receive this award. Irene was also one of the founders of the Latino Community Foundation along with her husband Armando. They have been wonderful uh, folks to, to, be, to be connected to. Um, they're just such beautiful people. And I just can't, I mean, when we were talking at, you know, back at the office about who should get this award, you know, we mentioned, I mentioned Irene right away, and everybody said it couldn't go to a, a much better deserving person. The one thing also that she's, she says this a lot, and I don't think she probably even recognizes she says this a lot, but every time I meet her, she says the following. We, Carlos, we have a responsibility to make it happen. That's Irene. And that's how I will always remember Irene as Carlos, make it happen. Irene, you present the Soul, S O U L, of the Soul Award. You are my mentor, you are a friend, and with that, if you'd come up and receive the award. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. My goodness. I didn't know who he was talking about there for a while. <laughs> they, are, they are two wonderful, wonderful people. And to see the accomplishments of Carlos thus far really do as he says, make my heart feel good about doing something that really matters. And of course, my good, good friend, Patricia. I mean, she'll do anything to tear through to get someone to do something for her and everybody else. And that's the kind of person you want. You want someone who's going to do the right thing and do it well and respected. And I really, really appreciate you. Well, I, today I do share the very joys of my family. It was joyful that they're here. You know, when you're working as a CEO, or you're going to school and working, then the families don't get together as much. But my family all showed up. And so thank you. I love you, everyone. And thanks for making it here. You know, the founders of Latino Community Foundation believed in the mission. And they believed strongly and heartily, heartily that they decided to fund a program. I should say we. Along with Sheila and all the resources from the Rose Community Foundation and many others in this state, they worked tirelessly to create the foundation as we all know it today. I want to make sure and thank the Rose Community Foundation because they were and did make it possible for something big to happen. But now we have something big that will take it over beyond one step and across many, many steps to make sure that the foundation stays strong, pr 
provides the kind of support to community foundations that we need and is there to further and further and further the very first wishes of the foundation and those that, that were involved. So looking forward to it. I want to also thank the grantees that are here today because you were the ones that first dared to try. How did you know we'd have the money? <laughs> Don't tell me it didn't come up in your minds, because it does. And, and you did such a wonderful job. You, you embraced everything that we wanted in that first, second, or third um, grantee funding. And it's not easy to do that. So congratulations. Thank you for the current grantees, and we're looking forward to more. And all the people that donated to the fund. You know, you take, you take your hard-earned dollars, you match it with your heart, as was being said by our prior speakers, and you put them together and you try to do something that makes a difference. And that is what we have today because of the people that have worked on it. And they have, some have donated funds, but some have donated and, and done the, the work. So I thank you for if you are in any of those pockets. And for those of you that are not, I invite you to, to see what it's all about, to feel the feeling of accomplishment and to feel like work, that working with others is really a better way. Personally, I am also so grateful for the love and, and support that I see every day happen in these programs, especially in the programs where we are doing things that are very challenging, as you heard from the earlier speakers. It's not easy to match small funds with big wishes. It's not easy to combine a very, very goal-oriented program, but, heart, but you want to put your heart in it too. And so for those of you that want to continue to do that, that are placed to do that, I would say, come on in. Try it. I bet you can do it. So thank you so much for this beautiful award. I want to call out my very special, special person. Everybody knows Armando. <laughs> and from my heart and my soul, thank you to everyone today. And I hope to see more and more of you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. When Ron Montoya was um, speaking earlier this morning, he was talking about the Latino Community Foundation engaging younger people, getting them involved, having them to understand philanthropy, and while at the same time having fun, being thought-provoking, and being an educational experience. This past summer, the Latino Community Foundation had an intern who, who came to us who wanted to learn more about uh, the foundation and what philanthropy is all about. So we brought him in. We're like, well, we're not quite sure what you're going to do yet, but come on in because we're not going to go ahead and exclude anyone. If people want to contribute, we'll find a way. 
And so we had the opportunity of having Armando Gonzalez Dorta to, to join us for about eight weeks during the summer. And I think during those eight weeks, he was kind of like, well, I'm not quite sure really what a foundation is about, what do you do, how it works, and so forth. So we were able to go ahead and teach him a little bit about the foundation. But what he then did is he gave back with his talents. He's an aspiring filmmaker, um, graphic artist, with an incredible creative, incredible creative mind. So he said to us, I know what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to go ahead and put a little sketch video to go ahead and teach people what it means to be a philanthropist. So we're going to debut his little video that he did for us about philanthropy. But before we do that, I'm going to have Armando say a few words about his experience at the Latino Community Foundation. Armando? Hello, everyone. I hope you're all having a great afternoon. Um, I had, like I said, over the summer, the great pressure to be part of the LCFC and work in the internship um, in the part of social media and marketing. Um, I learned very much in this internship. It was really great, uh, not only in the professional field, but also in the creative field. Uh, it helped me expand my ideas. It helped me um, develop more a lot of my, um, what I like, um, increase my, my boundaries, per se. Um, and at the same time, I learned a lot about philanthropy, for which is why Carlos, the staff, and I uh, put together this video to hopefully help you guys understand a little bit more um, about philanthropy and also to show you kind of the difference between um, philanthropy and charity. The same, for some reason, to be, and I mean, I have the problem myself, seem to be uh, blended together when they're completely different. So here's the video, and I hope everyone likes it. Bienvenidos. Thank you for visiting us. I'm Professor Garcia, the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado's official wise owl. I'm here to share with you how you can get engaged in advancing the Latino community of Colorado. First, let's start off by understanding the difference between philanthropy and charity. Charity is basically the act of giving assistance, financial or otherwise, to a person in need. For instance, giving someone who is hungry food, helping your neighbor who got laid off, or donating money or items at your church for needy families. Philanthropy is like the abuelita of charity. The impact is bigger than just helping a person. It helps transform lives, families, and communities. We tend to associate philanthropy with wealthy people, but the fact is that you are probably a philanthropist yourself. A philanthropist is simply someone who gives in a coordinated way where the result has a life-lasting impact on a person or community, bigger than what you or I could do alone. At the foundation, we utilize the generosity of people like you and invest it back into the community where it has a multiplying effect. Your generosity, no matter the amount, helps convey the giving nature of our community. Let me show you how a gift to the foundation benefits the community. First, your gift of $20, $50, $100 or more is pooled with others. Usually the foundation is able to match it so it grows into an even larger amount. Every year, the LCFC board, staff, and a group of community leaders develop a strategy to most effectively distribute the funds in a way that will directly provide assistance to the community. These leaders have their finger on the pulse of Latinos in Colorado, so they understand where opportunities are needed. The combined funds are then invested in alignment with this strategy in Latino organizations that deliver high-quality services around health, education, civic engagement, work career paths, and art and cultural experiences. After delivering these services, our partnering organizations report their results or impact back to us. After receiving the results, the foundation compiles the information and then puts together a summary so you, the investor, can know the impact that your gift has had. You will know how you have directly helped to transform lives, provide opportunities, and uplift communities around the state. That's philanthropy at its best. Philanthropy is powerful. It allows us to harness our community's human and financial capital and transform it into a driving force behind Colorado's success. Are you ready to be called a philanthropist? Gracias. So I hope everyone liked the video. Um, <laughs> And um, I know after being part of the LCFC, uh, I am ready to become a philanthropist, and so can you. 
uh, by filling in the envelopes that are either inside your folders or on the table. So um, the only question left to ask is, are you ready to become a philanthropist? Thank you. That concludes our luncheon program. I'm going to have Cease Ortiz come up so that she can tell you what the next uh, uh, part of the program is. Cease? Oh, there you are. <laughs> Sorry. I'm looking down. That's right. Thank That's you. Right. Okay, so I'm the closer uh, for, this morning, uh, for this morning session and lunch. Again, thank you very much. I, I keep saying we, it can't get any better, and then you have Carmona. What do you do with Mr. Car Dr. Carmona? He's wonderful. Um, so the net, we do have an afternoon that we, are, uh, we would love to have you be part of. For those of you that, are, uh, that signed up or want to um, attend the breakout sessions, they are uh, downstairs, and there are folks um, uh, at, the, at the entrance that can tell you exactly where to go. Again, there are two, three, two or three very slow um, elevators, so you can also take the stairs, which is again probably very uh, is healthy. So with that, um, and then what we'd like is if you would come back, so we can have some report outs about what you heard uh, we're doing in the Latino Age Wave and how we should continue the work. So we need your input as we continue to build uh, this uh, this effort in uh, the Metro County area and hopefully in Colorado. So with that, you're dismissed for another hour and then come on back and we can close out the session.